So welcome to the Vanderbilt Perioperative Medicine Seminar. We have a great opportunity today for you, Dr. Michael Manning. Just a little bit of housekeeping. The CME code that you can put in is 76244. So if you already have been registered, just text your code to that number there, which is, I, of course, on my phone, it says Conference CME. And then you have until 24 hours to do it. If you're a first-time attendee, you can use the QR code to register for VMC. See, I mean, if you have any problems with that, let us know. But that's the, the, the mechanism for you to keep track of this. And it goes straight to the website, as you can see below. This is a little bit of an advertisement, as we did for Dr. Banning. Now, for the next person, Dr. Scania will be uh, discussing pre-op risk assessment. That will be on June 14th, so a week from today at the same time. Thank you. Another plug into the fact that this series will be actually run by ACER, American Society for Enhanced Recovery. The next meeting happens to be in Nashville from September 11th to 13th. And since McAvoy usually does this, I believe he is the president when that meeting goes. So, you know, if you want to come and support him, it's a great opportunity for all of us who live here. It's easy to get to the meeting. It's really close. So I just wanted to put in a plug for that. If any of you are interested, I so you can sign up and register. So for Dr. Manning, I'd like to take a few minutes to let you know about his background. I'm sure he can tell you more, but... He earned his Ph.D. degree in cardiovascular physiology and his M.D. from the University of Kentucky. I guess for the SEC fans, don't hold that against him. Uh, completing his residency in anesthesia, Dr. Manning continued his training at Duke with a one-year clinical fellowship in adult cardiothoracic anesthesiology and a two-year research fellowship. He started at Duke as faculty in 2014. He was an associate professor at Duke University Medical Center since then and works with the divisions of cardiothoracic general vascular and transplant anesthesia. His practice focuses on cardiac surgery, including heart and lung transplant, high-risk patients for non-cardiac surgery and liver transplant. He serves as the research director for the Perioperative Medicine Fellowship at Duke. He is a subject matter expert on acute kidney injury for the Enhanced Recovery After Cardiac Surgery Society and is a member of the SCA's Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesia's Enhanced Recovery After Cardiac Surgery Task Force. His current research interests are ERAS-centered. Specifically, his work is focused on opioid-free anesthesia, goal-directed fluid therapy, and fluid balance and cardiac surgery and liver transplant with respect to renal outcomes. With that, I introduce Dr. Manning. All right, so these are my disclosures. So um, thank you very much for the invite to, to speak today and the, and the invitation. So one of the objectives, so I'll, I hope to leave you guys um, after this talk, I want you to leave and be able to consider how you use opioids in your own practice. And for those that don't aggressively use multimodal analgesics, um, to start thinking about how you can incorporate those into your practice. Also to kind of seek to understand the best practice approaches to using non-opioid and opioid analgesics together and look for opportunities where you can be more thoughtfully intentional. And we'll kind of hit on that a little bit more and what I mean by being thoughtfully intentional in our anesthetics. Um, hopefully look around you and find colleagues that are interested in partnering um, as you begin this journey to be a little bit more thoughtful and intentional with our opioid use. Like you said, I, I finished my clinical uh, and research fellowships and I came on faculty and uh, had the opportunity to bridge cardiac and the general transplant uh, groups. And when I did, uh, Tim Miller, some of you may know here at Duke, the first thing he said was, welcome to GVT. I want you to do a QI project. And I'd never done a QI project before. And so working around, trying to figure that out. I started teaching residents. And one of the, the general cases that I absolutely love to teach from a physiologic standpoint is laparoscopic cholecystectomy cases. They've got great cardiac physiology, the bed positioning, the insufflation, the effects on preload. It's really, really an excellent teaching case to get a lot of physiology in. And in doing that and working with the residents, what I noticed was that the patients weren't waking up as quickly as I was used to um, for my resident years. And I started to look around and pay a little bit more attention to how the cases were being conducted and talking to other faculty. What I observed was is that most of my patients were in the average age of 35 to 50. The case duration was about one and a half hours, and it was taken at the end of the case about 30 minutes for the patients to wake up. 
And what I found was is that interoperatively, the residents in the CRNAs that I was working with were using about 250 to 350 mics of fentanyl, giving about two milligrams of Dilaudid interoperatively. Those patients were going on to the recovery room and getting up to two milligrams of Dilaudid additional and 150 mics of fentanyl. And so for a three to five hour perioperative period, these patients are getting four milligrams of Dilaudid and up to 500 mics of fentanyl. So I said, okay, here is my quality improvement project. Um, we started by pulling 50 random charts of laparoscopic cholecystectomies at Duke between 2015 and, uh, or January 1st, 2015, and December 31st, 2015. And we were looking at the interoperative opioid use and the PACU opioid use. And what we found was that in these 50 cases, the bulk of the patients were getting 250 of fentanyl up front and a lot of Dilaudid intraoperatively, and then going on to the recovery room and getting equally high doses. When we looked at why this was mechanistically, you know, why were people turning to higher dose opioids? What we found was is that the practitioners, the attendings in the room were starting to, to migrate their practice to rush the induction. And so they were pushing all the drugs to induce anesthesia pretty quickly. The person at the head of the bed that was handling the airway was also doing an inhalation induction. The thinking was that they were going to bridge the IV induction and make sure that the patient didn't have awareness and that was the consideration. And so when the patients were intubated, the, the heart rate and the blood pressure went up. And then once the tube was taped in and then um, all these medications seemed to hit afterwards um, to treat the hypotension, the practitioners were turning down the vaporizers as part of that therapy. And then they would go on and get um, uh, temperature probes put in, OG tubes, additional IVs, and they would get a little distracted, leaving the patient a little bit lighter than what would be appropriate for a surgical incision. Surgery would start, the blood pressure and the heart rate would go up, as it would under light anesthesia. And then uh, the practitioners were giving uh, doses of opioid to treat the presumed pain that the patients were having, sometimes large doses of propofol too. And then this cycle we found through observation would repeat itself throughout the course of the case. We asked the question, is there a better way to achieve our desired outcomes? How do we do this? Some of you may have seen this. We, we published this in perioperative medicine back in 2018. This was kind of our standard practice. The foundation of everything we were doing was based on opioids. When patients failed opioids, we'd put them on an opioid PCA or add uh, acetaminophen, maybe ketamine. If that wasn't enough, then we would block them. Then we would use dexmedetomidine or lidocaine. So starting right off, we flipped that. We inverted the pyramid. So anybody that we could possibly, we would perform regional anesthesia. So numbing the port sites is important. Giving Tylenol and um, non-steroidals preoperatively. Giving patients lidocaine or magnesium intraoperatively and, and just adding on and adding on. And then at the end, if you needed opioids after all that, you we thought, okay, we could use a lot less and maybe they'd be a little bit more effective and avoid some of the side effects that opioids cause. In addition to that, to treat post-operative pain or in anticipation of extubation and, and setting the patients up for the PACIO period, we started teaching a little bit differently the plan for emergence. And so these are just kind of for illustration, but if we were planning to extubate at time zero, using the medications that we use, knowing their onset of action, we would go back and dose appropriately in time so that these medications, either morphine, toradol, IV acetaminophen, fentanyl, all of these would hit at about the time we were planning to extubate the patient. So give the medications in time for them to work to achieve the plasma levels that you would want to, to have a nice analgesic landing pad for the patients. So how are we going to do this? Where are we going to, how are we going to get there? So we came up with a basic kind of prescriptive pathway for laparoscopic cholecystectomies and we piloted this. 
And at the time that we were doing this, these are the medications that we would give to our patients in the pre-op holding area. So we'd start with gabapentin and Celebrex, Tylenol, and we'd give a little glycopyrrolate in anticipation of the ketamine. Interoperatively, we would use IV lidocaine, propofol, esmolol, substituting for the fentanyl to blunt the, the intubation response. We'd use ketamine, magnesium, um, dexamethasone, and then maintain with either SIVO ISO for maintenance. And this was our PACU uh, medications, and we always started with non-opioid medications first. And it was always left at the discretion of the provider in the room based on clinical judgment. If you feel that the patient needs or you have evidence to believe that the patient needs an opioid, feel free to use it. But we would want to layer that on top of this approach. And what we found in the first 56 patients that we did, intraoperative opioid use was cut down. So 14 out of 56 patients were given fentanyl intraoperatively. Two out of 56 got a little bit of Dilaudid. 13 out of 56 required some fentanyl in the PACU. 18 out of 56 required additional doses of hydromorphone. And you can see that that dosing is much different than what we started with. But what was really impressive for us in this pilot trial was that the post-operative opioid use was cut in almost half. The incidence of nausea and vomiting was decreased. It wasn't statistically significantly decreased. But what was really impressive to us was the PACU length of stay was cut significantly. The hospital length of stay went down a little bit, not statistically significant. But if you were to, uh, to ascribe dollars to bed hours, it becomes significant financial improvement, especially when you looked at PACU length of stay. And so this was the pilot that we we approached and set out to be very intentional in what we did, very thoughtful in what we did, and set up these guardrails and kind of a practice template for, for our practitioners and our providers, still allowing them the autonomy to use opioids when it, it was necessary. About that time that was finishing up, we were approached by um, some urologists that were doing robotic prostatectomies and their average length of stay for robotic prostatectomies was about four days. They were trying to cut it down to three days. And they approached us and they said, you know, we'd like to, to work with you guys to see if we can't change how we manage patients interoperatively for these robotic prostatectomies. We would like to get that length of stay down to two days. And we don't want to use epidurals for postoperative pain control. And we said, OK, this is a golden opportunity. Absolutely. But we need to be more thoughtful and more diligent in who we bring to the table. So we set out as an initiative together to work with our surgeons. We had anesthesia at the table. We brought on pharmacists. We had mid-level providers both in the uh, from the urology clinic and uh, that would take care of the patients out on the floor, as well as nurses from the surgical clinic, uh, interoperative, PACU, and out on the floor. And we all sat together trying to find the sweet, happy spot in the middle where everybody would be happy. Because we were viewing this, this pathway as a continuum. So patients coming in for pre-admission, they, they move through this entire continuum. And various stakeholders, various departments at the hospital all add their unique perspectives and focus on here. And so pain management was going to be an important component for this. And this is what we decided to focus on first. And so we listened to everybody around the table and had them bring their thoughts and concerns to us and, and laid it out on the table and worked through what we thought would work for each, each little uh, domain as the patients passed through it. As we started off, the patients coming in at the time of contemplation for surgery, we set up a pilot study um, and targeted those men that were coming to surgery that had a desire to return to full function. They were highly motivated patients that had comorbidities. They were either obese, obstructive sleep apnea, et cetera, hypertension, uh, mobility issues. We wanted to avoid the side effects of opioids, and particularly those men that had a history of postoperative nausea and vomiting. What we developed was 
first in the preoperative area when the surgeons had them in clinic and decided, okay, we're going to do the surgery for you. We had the surgeons buy in and get them to start educating the patients and setting expectations for the experience that they were going to have going through surgery. That included reinforcing the expectations for pain control. Right off the bat, they're hearing from the surgeons. They were describing the, what the insufflation would feel like. The surgeons were saying it's going to feel like you've done a thousand sit-ups. Um, there may be some residual carbon dioxide uh, retained. Those bubbles are getting get up under the diaphragm. It's going to feel like you've um, been putting boxes on a shelf over your head all day in the garage. Your shoulders may ache. Um, walking or changing positions the night of surgery is going to help relieve that pain. Um, it usually resolves in 12 to 24 hours, uh, assuring that the patients that opioids don't really treat that very well, that it's more a muscle relaxant. So we're going to use low dose benzodiazepines uh, to help with the abdominal cramping in the post-operative period. If you feel like that's an issue, uh, we're certainly going to facilitate you mobilizing and getting up. And our nurses in the recovery room were like, yes, we will help you mobilize these patients and get them up out of bed. And so that approach was very, very key. And we had the nurses in the pre-op holding the morning of surgery reinforce this script with the patients. So they've heard it in the clinic from the surgeons. They've heard it in the, uh, the pre-op holding area from the nurses that intake them. They hear it the morning of surgery. We reinforce it as the anesthesia team. So by the time they actually get into surgery, they've heard this three different times. We took a, a slight amalgam of uh, what we had used in the laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy trials and applied that here. So there were some surgeons that were very, very quick operating at about two hours, and there's some surgeons that worked a little bit longer under the robot, but more or less, this is kind of the same pathway that we were using from the cholecystectomy patients. So intraoperatively, um, we would conduct it with IV lidocaine, propofol, esmolol, would give a small ketamine bolus and a magnesium bolus over about 15 minutes, dexamethasone, rocuronium, and maintained under sevoflurane for Ortiva for maintenance. When we emerge from anesthesia, we give a little bit of Ketorolac if um, there wasn't a lot of bleeding. And then right before uh, emergence from anesthesia, patients would get their uh, Zofran given in a small esmolol bolus if their heart rate or blood pressure were climbing, a little bit of ketamine, a little bit of IV lidocaine. And in the post-operative period, again, we use the exact same um, panel that we, we used in laparoscopic cholecystectomy. We used um, Tylenol that began scheduled the day before surgery, continued it in the recovery period. Morphine uh, is a single dose, fentanyl is a rescue. We tried to stay away from sedating medications for postoperative nausea, vomiting, and left Finnergan as a rescue medication. Um, rarely would patients need anything other than Haldol. Occasionally, we would get to, to Benadryl. And then fluids uh, would stop as soon as the patients were awake enough to, to have PO. And along with this, we worked with the hospital to develop dashboards to track the success. And so every member of the care team could call this dashboard up and look not only to see in the pre-operative space the percentage of patients who were consistently getting their Celebrex, their Gabapentin, and their Tylenol, but we're also able to see at the time of discharge what patients were getting a prescription of greater than 15 oxycodone or uh, the number that were getting 15 or less along with their Gabapentin uh, prescriptions and the Celebrex prescriptions to continue on. The initial feedback we got from the pilot in this, there were several men that came back to clinic. The urologist reported back and told us that those that had had surgery before for different cases compared to this experience, um, it was staggering. Their return to function was much faster. They felt way more awake, um, much more mentally clear. Even after going home, they felt just much, much better. And so we put this into practice and followed it for a year. What we found um, in this, the way we did this analysis, we took two years of patients prior to the one year of our actual intervention, our, our pathway implementation. 
and we matched those patients two to one in a propensity matched. And we found that the average post-operative opioid use was significantly reduced. We didn't have much of a significant change in post-operative nausea, vomiting, although the patients reported feeling much, much better. When we looked at hospital length of stay, the hospital length of stay dropped by about eight hours. Now that had a significant cost and improved patient throughput on the service, but the PACU length of stay was much reduced. Patients were ambulating in the recovery room, patients were starting to eat in the recovery room, and patients were starting to report um, feeling much better, much more quickly. We started to kind of look around and say, you know, why, why are we using opioids in the first place? Um, certainly as much as we are, and this is Paul Jansen, um, the, the gentleman that gave us fentanyl, sufentanyl, remifentanyl, and alfentanyl. And so obviously we blunt the sympathetic and neuroendocrine response with, with opioids and blunt the airway instrumentation and the surgical stimuli. And it's, opioids are great. They have no direct negative ionotropic effects. They found favor in cardiac anesthesia. I use them all the time for that. They seem to be cytoprotective. There is some element of preconditioning and they are potent acute analgesics and there are reversal agents needed for them. But they also in the perioperative setting come with a high risk of respiratory depression, especially in the surgical population. It does alter immunologic function and produces differential effects, and that's been shown in cancer and angiogenesis. Patients do have differential tolerances to opioids. Opioid use does induce hyperalgesia. And postoperative effects are the more of the common things that we see patients complaining about and really not tolerating very well, such as nausea, vomiting, and the itchiness. And it certainly does have an effect on the quality of recovery and the length of stay, both in the recovery room and in the hospital, mostly due to ileus and nausea and vomiting effects. And TJ Gann, about that time that we were finishing the Lap Coley uh, pilots, um, shared some data with us that over the last 20 years, the way we treat pain um, in surgery hasn't really changed very much. And that's probably because we use opioids as a foundation and have for a long time. And so when, you know, there's mild pain, we give some opioids. And when the patients have more pain, we give more opioids. And of course, when they have severe pain, we give a lot of opioids. And this comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of increased adverse events. And when TJ um, surveyed patients on what their preferences would be, would they rather have um, no vomiting and fair pain relief, or would they tolerate moderate vomiting and good pain relief? Same with nausea or constipation or mental clarity. By far and away, most patients want to not be vomiting, not have nausea vomiting. They, they don't want these adverse side effects that opioids carry, and certainly the mental clarity is one that we focused in on for the um, robotic prostatectomies, the men wanted to be mentally clear. And we have found subsequently our patient populations want to be clear and wake up quicker after surgery. And there's a lot of great evidence that opioids use intraoperatively begets opioid use. So uh, this was a great study by Collard et al. from uh, two, 2007, and it was in patients undergoing hysterectomies and they divided it into two groups a low dose fentanyl group and a high dose fentanyl group. Now this is a relatively really high dose of fentanyl. When they looked at pain after surgery, up to 16 hours, the pain that patients had in the higher dose opioid group persisted. Interesting that it required higher doses of opioids in the post-operative period to bring the pain down. So higher doses of opioid intraoperatively led to higher pain postoperatively up to 16 hours in this group, in this study. And it required more opioids over time to bring that pain down. And when you look at database studies that look at um, new persistent opioid use, whether you define that as um, using any opioid between 90 and 100 days after surgery or um, getting a refill of opioids after 90 days after surgery. 
this was published in three different large databases, lots of patients in these trials. 13 to 21 year olds had almost a 5% risk of persistent opioid use. 18 to 64, about 6%, older than 66, 3.1%. Now that's significant in our patients when you think about it. And this was a great paper that came out in JAMA about the time we were getting really set up with our um, robotic prostatectomies, breaking down the incidence of new opioid use past 90 days for various different types of surgeries. And col um, colectomies have almost a 10% persistent opioid use. Bariatric surgery is almost 80%. Laparoscopic cholecystectomy, almost 6%. And so this really helped us reinforce our intentional use and thoughtful use and approach to opioids and how we treat pain and questioning, are we doing the right thing? Now, we're talking about ERAS pathways and opioid stewardship and opioid reduction and opioid free anesthesia. And this paper came um, out and it was very, very interesting, although pretty, pretty obvious in the result. They were looking at the effect of prescribing practices at discharge after implementation of an interoperative ERAS pathway. And what they found was is that pre-ERAS to ERAS, they too reduced their intraoperative opioid use, but the prescribing practices didn't change. When we attacked our robotic prostatectomy, we brought the providers in, we brought the mid-levels in, we brought the people that were going to do the discharge planning and had a pathway in place where they would evaluate opioid use for the patients in the 24 hours prior to discharge and make determinations on opioid prescribing at the end. During the pilot, it was funny. There were a lot of men that went through the first nine that we did. Of the nine, two of them got opioids at discharge. And when we looked and asked the providers, the nurses that discharged them, saw when they gave opioids, we asked, you know, well, what was their pain? Well, they didn't have any pain. I I felt like they, you know, they hadn't used any opioids all the whole time they were here. So, you know, I gave them some. And so it required a little bit more education. So I think to do an upstream practice without supporting downstream thinking um, is going to lead to to outcomes like this, where you're not really affecting much change on the back end. So currently, where are we with this? If you do a PubMed search and you look for opioid free anesthesia or opioid free anesthesia, the British spelling, you're going to get about 187 papers since 2018. So this is coming on and it's it's finding more favor. And there's a lot of case reports uh, using opioid free techniques in per particular circumstances or for certain reasons, patients with opioid addiction or other other issues such as that. There's only a small number of case series or small studies um, demonstrating benefits. I don't mean small number of studies demonstrating benefits. I mean studies with small numbers of patients that have demonstrated benefits. Very few reviews as of yet the best medications to use, how you mix them um, and the techniques are still poorly defined. Two recent papers that have come out, I think really highlight um, an excellent clinical application. This one uh, in obesity surgery looked at two groups of patients undergoing bariatric surgery from October of 2020 through July of 21, two groups of about 50 patients, opioid-free versus opioid-based anesthesia. And what they found was is that pain scores were better in the opioid-free group all through um, at least post-operative day one. When you looked at the types of surgery, patients that received opioid-free anesthesia did better. When they looked at the quality of the recovery across the board, uh, the opioid-free group had much better quality of recovery scores. This is a great systematic review for opioid-free anesthesia and thoracic surgery. This study looked at only six studies 
in their final analysis that met the criteria for inclusion. Significant reductions in post-operative complications, especially in the thoracic surgery population, they require early respiratory and pulmonary um, exercises, shorter length of stay, uh, post-operative OEMs were lower, post-operative pain scores were identical. So opioid-free is achieving the same results as if you used opioids with just less side effects. And only one study out of the, the group showed better scores uh, during the hospitalization. So what's next? Me, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of calling this opioid-free anesthesia. I think that's a dis, I think that does a disservice to what we do, and I think it doesn't really convey what we're trying to do. It's not we're doing non-opioid analgesic anesthesia because we are doing some pain medications. It's just not this class of pain medications. So where are we? What's next? Now we're looking at our uh, cardiac surgery patients, and so the approach that we could have taken was either all in and we're going to commit fully to an ERAS pathway and we're going to just do everything um, that there's been a couple of publications. Judd Williams uh, over here at Wake Med did a, a very nice paper in JAMA where he applied, I think it was 27 different ERAS pathway steps, or you could do a pilot study of components of the pathway being very selective. Um, I was part of a, a consensus writing group that tackled the question of pain management and opioid stewardship in adult cardiac surgery. And this was part, part of the POKI uh, initiative, along with the um, Enhanced Recovery After Surgery Society with the SCA. In cardiac surgery and cardiac anesthesia, certainly the anesthetic is primarily opioid-based. And we felt in the consensus achieved um, that this is probably really an opportunity for improving both concerns with delayed post-operative recovery, longer ventilation times, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, uh, risks with ileus. Um, and so the recommendations that this paper put out was to avoid the high dose opioid anesthesia, to utilize opioids in a more judicious fashion, um, educate the patients, adopt a multidisciplinary pain management pathway is very similar to what we did with our robotic prostatectomies. And we developed a template that we would use or recommended patient or people use as they apply this to their patients. We decided to kind of look at our own practice first as we started to do this. And this is data that was presented at the SCA several years ago. In our cardiac practice, we looked at faculty that had been here for five years or longer, lined them up, and we looked at our individual practice. And what we found was that there was pretty decent variability between providers, but within your own self as a provider, your use of opioids was very different. Um, and so very, very high variability. So we decided to attack this with patient education consistent use of preoperative uh, medications, using non-opioid analgesics first, targeting opioid reduction, and then using non-opioid analgesics first in the scheduled in the, in the ICU as patients transitioned on out onto the floor. And so one of the things that is really key for that for us, um, we started to use regional anesthesia. So for heart port robotic surgery, we implemented uh, pectoralis one and two blocks or serratus anterior for traditional sternotomy. Uh, we're approaching it with parasternal blocks and anterior rectus sheath. Um, our goal is to ultimately get to paravertebral blocks, but we're sticking with the anterior chest wall first. And so we're really um, applying these PEX blocks to get the anterior surface of the chest um, and where the chest tubes come out. Um, it's just a very nice, dense coverage. Um, patients are doing very, very well with that. For the parasternal blocks, we're going far outside of the internal thoracic arteries. We don't want to bugger that up. We do that after induction, before sternotomy, and we're having very good success with that. Interoperatively, when we do the blocks, uh, we set up our patients with non-opioid bolus medications and non-opioid infusions. Again, this is recommendations. It's left to the discretion of the providers in the room. 
in clinical judgment, and we're having uh, pretty good results with that. So the outcomes for these cardiac cases, stay tuned. That'll be good, uh, good next year's talk. Considering implementing non-opioid analgesic, what we found in our history of doing this for the last several years, um, it's we found that it's very, very important to set patients' expectations. Um, when we were setting those and having the, the, the discussions with the patients having prostatectomies, we would see our patients in the recovery room and they would say, hey, doc, you know, my belly, it feels like I've done a thousand sit-ups, just like you said. Well, is it, is it bad? You know, do you, do you want us to treat that? No, no, no. It's just it's exactly the way you said, or, hey, you know, my shoulder aches, just like you said it would. And I think understanding and having that realization that this was an expected event and understanding the cause of it, much, much different response from the patients, much different response. So I can't overstress education or the role that education plays way before surgery time. And patients just want to know why is this happening? The second is non-opioid analgesics alone may not reduce opioid exposure. So it really for us took buy-in. So nursing staff in the clinic that deal with the patients uh, in the surgery clinics, in the pre-op area, in the recovery area, out on the floor, getting their involvement is absolutely key. Um, letting them know that the consistent and timely administration of non-opioid medications, alternating Tylenol or ibuprofen uh, at the right times and making sure that those don't, there's no lapses in that was uh, really, really important. As well as non-opioid analgesic, um, just know that that it is possible to do it. It can be successfully implemented in some patients when they're going surgery. Ease into it. You don't, it's not a... Um, all or nothing thing. And it's even even today, we have a lot of practitioners that um, say they're just really uncomfortable doing that, despite the patients doing very, very well, having excellent data to show that it's uh, the, the analgesia that the patients have and the, the comfort level is the same, if not a little bit better than when they use traditional opioids, just knowing that uh, you can make progress that way. Um, and that's all that I will leave you with. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manning. I, uh, <laughs> when you black this out for a second, I'm like, I can't even do anything. So I wanted to thank you very much for this talk. I, I would tell you, if, uh, just from my perspective, two things I enjoyed hearing from you was the whole concept of opioid free versus, well, we don't really mean that there's going to be nothing. It's just a matter of reducing and that's fantastic. And then I'll, I'll look for questions here, but I have a, a secondary comment. I heard a a rumor, and rumors are always dangerous, but I thought uh, I would bring it, ask you about it. Is there opportunities at your place, I heard, that you might be trying to see if Xperil will work with certain blocks or epidurals, or is that just a rumor? So we are using Xperil um, almost exclusively in our cardiac blocks. We will mix, okay. bupiv we'll mix a quarter percent bupivacaine with Xperil, and um, those blocks will set up to surgical grade blocks within about 45 minutes. So by the time we do the central lines, uh, the patients are prepped and draped and they actually get around to cutting skin. We have a very nice dense block. And then by the time that wears off the Xperil, six hours usually kicks in and, and is lasting about two to three days for the PEX1, PEX2 blocks. Um, the peristernal blocks seem to be maybe a little bit longer, closer to three days. But that's kind of preliminary, preliminary data for that. Thank you. And uh, just a quick, there's a chat, you know, thank you very much for this from uh, one of the participants, Danelle. So at least you should hear all the, the positives too. And then there is a question from, oh, from Jennifer J. Ram. <laughs> Go ahead. Jen, what do you want? Hi, Dr. Manning. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner on our periop and pain services, and I also work as the ERAS coordinator here. So, of course, this um, everything you were talking about is near and dear to my heart and our daily work um, at Vanderbilt um, in trying to expand our ERAS program. So, I really found it interesting, the um, information about the provider variability in terms of um, opioid uh, utilization and practice. That is something we've also seen in our data with the compliance around our um, opioid stewardship. I guess my question would be, you know, 
our million dollar question always seems to be how to engage uh, people in um, better compliance to our ERAS protocols mm -hmm. and how to, I guess, how to address that kind of provider buy-in um, to, to change that paradigm, you know, kind of that entrenched belief of, of needing opioids for all types of cases and all types of patients. Yeah. How you guys uh, have handled that there? Great, great question. So that's, that's what we struggled with. What we found that worked well was to bring data and we kind of, you know, in God we trust everybody else bring data. So providing the providers with evidence of their compliance was key. So that's where our dashboards, I think, are very effective. Um, nobody likes to be an outlier. And so if you show your data compared to everybody else's data and you, you know, that's how the impogs work very nicely is I think a motivator, right? If you're the outlier, I don't, I don't want to be the outlier, right? So showing individuals data, if you can get that granular is key. The other is just education and education and education and reassurance. Um, you're not going to get everybody to buy into this. We still don't have everybody that buys into it, but we are making a significant improvement um, over where we started. Um, you know, giving somebody for an hour and a half long, minimally invasive cholecystectomy, that should be an outpatient procedure everywhere else in the world, four milligrams of Dilaudid and 500 of fentanyl, it's just no. And so data and um, data and dashboards are, I think, the key. I don't know, you know, that data and dashboards. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's any other questions, but I'll ask another one while people are jumping up to ask questions. But do you have any, it sounds like you don't have any issues. We have been going back and forth with parasternals about the, our uh, cardiac uh, fellow attendings are concerned about having local anesthetic near their uh, remas and lemas before the incision. Uh, and though in situations they do have us to them pre-op, what, what do you think about that? And what have, what have you done to solve that problem? I mean, it doesn't stay there that long, but 45 minutes to an hour, it's probably going to be a little different. But, you know, ours complain, you know, uh, you're too close to this. Um, and Yeah, so having conversations with them, remind them of the anatomy. For the ones that are dubious, we invite them to the OR to watch the block, watch where we put it. We don't go below the ribs. We stay above the ribs. Uh, so we'll go in, make contact on the rib, get in that plane and kind of hydro dissect over top. And so we're assured of the being in the plane. Um, so we we show them, look, we're nowhere near. We're doing it with ultrasound and we have nice ultrasounds and good needles and uh, providers that know what they're doing. Um, and so bringing them in so it's not a mystery, not a not a concern. And then we ask, what are you seeing on the inside? Ha have we ever poked a hole where we shouldn't have poked a hole? Well, no. OK, well, OK, you know, sure, it's a risk anytime you stick a needle in somewhere, but we're doing due diligence. And unless the the Lima or the LED or the Lima runs, you know, lateral sideways, we're not going to we're not going to get into trouble. So, I, you know, I think just bringing them in and, and let them be a part of it off the bat. Thank you. Another uh, great presentation by Cassandra Jones. Any other questions? Dr. Shams, I was kind of hoping that that might stimulate a question from because uh, you mentioned the fact that you were doing them superficially versus deep, which we tend to do superficially or two. Dr. Shams. The, uh, yeah, I mean, that, that was that was part of the question. It sounds like then you all are doing the superficial block, the superficial parasternal block. Um, and then secondarily, I, I may have missed it. I'm sorry, I was in and out of the conversation uh, for clinical duties. There was, at least in the cardiac section, uh, mention of methadone intraoperatively, it's going to be a two-part question. First is, do you know about what the average dose is ending up being for those cardiac cases? I know you had listed at 0.1 to 0.3 for your protocol. Are they tending towards the higher end of that or tending towards the lower? Um, we started at 0.3 ideal body weight and then mm -hmm. dropped it down to 0.2 ideal body weight. That's not for everybody. The men, uh, patients with opioid um, use at baseline. We do have a lot of drug induced IV medication, vegetative mm -hmm. endocarditis patients. We'll use so higher. We, we do as well. Yeah, we'll use the higher dose for those, give that an induction, but it's always uh, to ideal body weight. When we first started doing it, we'd had some patients or some providers um, give it uh, to true body weight. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you know had a little little yeah. issues with protracted ventilation. No, certainly. I mean, there's there's one case report from years ago where they gave 0.7 mix per keg, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah, for an 80 year old who took three to four days to wake up. The second question was, have you all worked at all on utilizing methadone for ambulatory surgery? I know there are a couple of papers that have been published looking at that for some laparoscopic surgeries. I don't know if that's anything that y'all have been yes. thinking about or looking at. Uh, we do. Uh, Evan Karish is here, um, mm-hmm. and he is a big proponent of methadone. And uh, we do have some providers that will use methadone. Generally, we will start with 10 milligrams and then increment in one to two milligram additions if need be. Evan just did a an inguinal uh, hernia, and the uh, patient got 10 milligrams of methadone shortly after induction and that was that was all the opioids they got thank you yeah i mean i think the the one study that i remember that's they ended up at 0.15 mix per keg ideal body weight which is essentially nine to ten for everyone yeah well it is now pretty much reaching five o'clock unless there are any other questions i'd like to once again thank you dr manning and we enjoy thank hearing you. that good work is being done there we need something to look look up to thank so you thank you very much And to everybody else, have a good evening. Take care.